You are listening to KLRN Radio, where liberty and reason still reign. Most writers and radio show hosts know that to connect with your fans, you need to do more than just write books or record the latest podcasts. There are many different elements that go into forming an online platform, but there are also many hidden traps. To make matters worse, solid advice on how to survive the muddy waters is scarce. In the book Hidden Traps, I talk about some of the important issues of working with an online platform, highlighting traps that could put your physical or internet security at risk or be harmful to your reputation. Are your social media posts just links with a few disjointed words making you look like someone who can't complete a sentence? Did your new website cost you more than you anticipated? Are you leaking your personal contact details across the web without even knowing it? Then you need Hidden Traps. Although Hidden Traps is not officially released until August 1st, you can pre-order your paperback or ebook copy now from a variety of retailers, including Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and Kobo. Visit BlackWolfPublications.com for more details. Here's George Foreman with InventHelp. Hi, I'm George Foreman. Do you have an idea for a new product or invention? People ask me all the time, George, how do I get my idea in front of companies? How do I get a patent? What do I do next? Do you have the same questions? I'll tell you like I'll tell them all. Call my friends at InventHelp. Call InventHelp today for free information. InventHelp has been helping inventors for more than 30 years and has sales offices nationwide. InventHelp can submit your invention to companies who are interested in receiving new ideas. If you have an idea and want to try to patent it and submit it to companies, you should call InventHelp today for free information. Listen, I can't guarantee a company will be interested in your idea, but I believe every inventor deserves the opportunity to step into the ring and take their best shot. Put InventHelp in your corner. Get your free inventor's information. Call 1-800-353-6490. That's 1-800-353-6490. Again, 1-800-353-6490. KLRN Radio has advertising rates available. We have rates to fit almost any budget. Contact us at advertising at klrnradio.com. This is Slickery Trigger for Rebel Road Tactical. With proper care and feeding, your pistol will be ready when you need it. There to save your life. Shouldn't your gear be that good? Whether you need a holster for comfortable, everyday carry, or a tough-as-nails holster for your next training course, Rebel Road Tactical has what you need. Check us out on the web at rebelroadtactical.com. Tired of paying outrageous prices for Viagra? Well, we have great news for you. Now you can finally get Viagra at huge discounts. Healthy Man allows you to save up to $500 on Viagra. Why pay U.S. pharmacy prices of $15 per pill or more when you can get Viagra for less than $3 a pill? Call today and get 40 Viagra pills for only $99. This can cost as much as $600 at your local pharmacy. You can't afford not to call us. If you want Viagra at the lowest prices, never pay $15 a pill pharmacy prices again. Get Viagra for less than $3 a pill. Call 1-800-516-7602 today and save up to $500 and get 40 pills for just $99. Healthy Man is fast, easy, and affordable. Operators are waiting at 1-800-516-7602 to take your call right now. Call 1-800-516-7602. That's 1-800-516-7602. Again, 1-800-516-7602. If you're 85 or younger, would you like peace of mind and comfort for your family? We're Final Expense Direct with an urgent message for you. The average funeral today costs over $8,000, but the most you'll get from government benefits is $255. How will your family pay the difference? We can help. Our senior plans start as low as just a dollar a day and pay up to $30,000 for a funeral and other final expenses. Peace of mind is easy. There's no medical exam. You'll have lifetime coverage, and your plan can't be canceled as long as you pay your premiums. Call now for free information about our senior plans. Answer a few simple questions and receive approval right on the phone. Plus, call right now, and we'll give you a discount prescription card for free. Call 800-553-8687. That's 800-553-8687. Again, 800-553-8687. 
8687. This episode of Conversations in Science contains some material that might not be suitable for younger audiences. Parental guidance is advised. The world around us is an amazing place filled with beauty and with science. But let's face it, Sometimes science can be so confusing that it takes a PhD to understand it. Well, you're in luck. I just happen to have a PhD. Come and take a seat. Perhaps I can explain the world around us in a way we all can understand. Welcome to Conversations in Science. I'm Dr. Judy L. Moore. Call me Doc. This episode of Conversations in Science contains some material that might not be suitable for younger audiences. Parental guidance is advised. Hi, guys, and welcome to another episode of Conversations in Science. Yes, I am Dr. Judy Elmore, and yes, as my intro says, I do have a PhD. For those of you who are new to the show, this is how it works. I do the best I can to explain some of the science around me, but my producer, Jesse Sanders... What's up, yes, Doc? How are you? Hi, Jess. Right, Jesse's around to make sure that I don't get too technical because, let's face it, I'm a scientist. Sometimes I get too technical. So that's what happens. So, Jess, today, what are we talking about? Because you asked for this one specifically. Yeah, Doc, I asked for one about the WMDs because, well, they're in the news a lot. You got people like Bashar al-Assad shooting them off everywhere and then you got... Dash or ISIS or ISIL, depending on what term you want to use, throwing mustard gas on everything. And, well, I just figured it would make a good show topic for you, Doc. Okay, so WMDs, an acronym. I'm not a military person. What are WMDs? Well, why don't we get our extra guest that's on today, Dave Brewer, who is a military person, to answer that one. That is a good idea. (laughs) Hi, Jesse. Hi, hi, Doc. Hi. So, Dave, what is a WMD? Okay. A WMD is a weapon of mass destruction. Uh, To put it quantitatively, you have your small arms, you have your slightly larger than small arms, which will take out a few people at a time at most. Think guns, mortars, rockets. A weapon of mass destruction will kill hundreds and thousands of people at once. To okay, so these are not good things? Definitely not good things. Uh, <laughs> uh, on, also included besides the stuff that they're using in Syria for weapons of mass destruction would be things like the nuclear bomb. It will take out a whole city. That's definitely mass destruction. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> We talked it's about a those mushroom destruction. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we talked about those things, Doc. We did. We did. We did. We talked about atomic weapons back when we were talking about what heavy water was, if I remember rightly. Yes, cuz I was trying to figure out how a nuclear reactor worked and why we had to worry about things like heavy water. So, I guess we're back to another one of more my topics than yours, but I still didn't get all the science, so I'm going Help, Doc. But this time I didn't call out on air. I just called you. (laughs) Okay. So we're talking about today about some of these weapons that are used in not necessarily a nice way. But we're also going to talk about what the military do to help prepare their soldiers against some of these, uh, how to protect themselves. And we're going to talk about a little bit 
about what some of these weapons actually do to the body. So you can understand that from a general population, we're probably okay unless we happen to get caught in warfare. Let's, we just won't go there. Okay, so. Well, there's only one person on this call that may be caught up in warfare. Yeah. Yeah. There is one. So, Dave. Yes, Judy. You are active military. Yes. What does the military do to prepare you and your fellow soldiers so, for this situation? Okay. So for the case of um, weapons of mass destruction, or chem- usually we get chemical weapons training once a year, and you do it with your unit. We also get the chemical weapons training and basic training. So a brand new recruit that comes into the military is going to have some basic knowledge of chemical weapons. Um, The stuff that we do to prepare is we learn how to use what's called a pro mask, a protective mask. It's a rubber gas mask that keeps the air clean that we breathe and keeps us from inhaling anything that we shouldn't. Uh, There's also what's called a mop suit. Uh, MOP is one of these crazy military acronyms. It stands for Mission Oriented Protective Posture. So it's got two P's instead of the MOP you use on the floor. Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, In short, this MOP suit covers us from head to toe. It's trousers. It's a jacket. It's rubber boots, rubber gloves. The jacket has a hood on it that is meant to... Uh, cover everything except for our face. It cinches down around our protective mask when we have it on. And it gets kind of technical as far as, uh, we'll say, different levels of mop. All that's referring to is how much of the gear we have on at once. But we... Okay, now, these are... So these mop gear suits that you use, they are not the same sort of suits that you might see if you were watching say the movie outbreak no they're they different suits aren't they yes they are what they were using in outbreak was a full body one piece suit that would have a airline attached to it and they got their air from a centralized location and it still kept them well i won't say it kept them cool because they were still sweating in those suits the mob suits essentially are layers of protection One of the easy ways of defending against chemical weapons agents or biological, well, really chemical weapons agents is to put on more layers of material. The mob suits do have different uh, materials built into them to absorb the chemicals and keep it away from our skin and from us breathing it in. Um, We don't have a centralized air source. We're just breathing air in through our protective okay. mask. And All right, so you're breathing in the air that comes through the mask. How different are these masks that, say, I don't know, a builder might use when they're, um, you know, trying to filter out dust? Okay. How different are they? Um, the filter is going to be uh, higher quality. It will still filter out the dust, but it'll filter out a lot more. And also, the mask itself will seal around the edge of our face. One of the first things that we do, let's say we get, you know, we get their alarm signal that, hey, there's chemical weapons. First thing you do is you reach into your pouch that will be on your hip, pull out your mask, close the pouch, put the mask on your face, pull the head straps over your head, and seal it down. And to test to make sure that it is sealed properly, we'll cover the port where we exhale through. We'll cover that and essentially try and inhale and exhale. We'll exhale like three times to clear the mask of anything of anything that's inside the mask with us. And then make sure Okay. Th- and then we suck in to make sure that it's sealed. And Okay. How long do you have to get all this done, Dave? To get the mask on, you have nine seconds. and That's actually a long time. It's a long time, 
but there's a lot of stuff to do. It may not seem like it. I mean, when we say seconds, a lot of people think that a, a second is actually a really short time. And in some respects, it is. But when you actually have to count, you know, the, the one Mississippi, two Mississippi, nine seconds is actually a long time. You may think it's so a long it's- time, but when you're in a rush to do everything and do everything right, most people can probably do this with training in seven to eight seconds. Okay. But, but the standard is nine. And then okay. you, then I believe it's uh, seven or nine minutes afterwards of a chemical weapon alarm going off that you have to have the rest of the mop suit on. And hopefully, wow. Yeah. <laughs> And hopefully by the okay. time you've got everything on, you are you haven't been exposed yet. Now, question, okay. is this one of those situations, like they say on the airline, help yourself, then help the person next to you? Yes. You put your mask on first. You don't worry about anybody else's mask. Because if you're, if you don't, if you take care of your buddy next to you first before putting on your own, you will likely be the first one to become a casualty, which is never yeah. a good thing. No, I can imagine. Definitely, I can imagine. Um, so, okay, so you're you're pre- you're protecting yourself against, and you you basically said chemical weapons in, in most sort of things. What sort of chemical weapons? Dare I be the pessimist here? Um, would you be potentially be facing? It could be anything from mustard gas to uh, sarin to VX. Uh, Sarin and VX are nerve agents. The mustard gas, I believe, is a blister agent or a choking agent. There's also a okay. chlorine gas. So we've got so we've got mustard gas. And okay, so for those, this is where I suppose I I can come in. For those that are wondering, mustard gas itself, it's the reason why it's called mustard gas is because it's yellow. It is. It looks like yellow, but it actually is. It's a compound that's made up of chlorine and sulfur, and it's the sulfur component of the mustard gas that gives it that yellow color. I, I don't know if any of if either you, Jess, or or Dave has actually seen raw sulfur. Um, I've I seen have. pictures. I've seen pictures of the yellow powder. <laughs> I actually have some in in my rock collection, and yes, I do have a rock collection of actual um, raw sulfur. It, it is it's just bright yellow, and that's all it is. It's just this bit of a yellow rock. So, Doc, this isn't the same thing that I put on my hot dog. That's called mustard, is it? No, no. So the, the mustard Definitely on my hot dog is still safe. Oh, yes, yes. Your mustard on the hot dog is definitely safe. And the reason why the mustard on the hot dog is called mustard is because of that mustard color. And let's face it, that mustard color. But that mustard color comes from not sulfur. Sulfur is not good for human body. Human body don't like sulfur. But sulfur is that mustardy color again. And that's why the mustard gas has got the that yellow color to it. And the reason why the human body doesn't like sulfur is when you actually mix sulfur with water, and of course, for those we've had, I think we've had this conversation before. I'm not sure when we had this conversation, but okay, Doc. So I think we covered the sulfur and water when we were talking about global warming or climate change. Yes, yes, we did. That 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 is what it is. So basically, the human body is made up of mostly water, and but when you mix sulfur with water, you get sulfuric acid. So if you were unfortunate unfortunate enough to breathe in something that's actually got a high concentration of sulfur in, in its gaseous state, it's going the, the sulfur itself is going to mix with the water in your lungs, just that, that thin layer that you have in your throat and, and bits of, like the saliva and stuff like that, and it's going to turn to sulfuric acid. That's not good news. No. And that's why so that's why mustard gas is is very deadly because the sulfur component. Chlorine on the other hand, so you do have chlorine gas and then of course but mustard gas has also got chlorine in it as well. Chlorine when you mix that with water, you get hydrochloric acid. Ouch. 
So, wait a minute, are we talking about the same chlorine we use to uh, purify the water, or not purify, but keep the water clean in our swimming pools? Yeah, there's a little bit, but that's why the chlorine in our swimming pools is such small concentrations. And that's also why you have to actually measure the chlorine quite frequently. You have to keep a good eye on it, because if you have too much chlorine in your swimming pool, then you are basically swimming in a pool of hydrochloric acid. Ouch, so, let's not say we didn't, Doc. So that's why it burns my eyes when I open my eyes in the pool. That's exactly why it burns your eyes when you open your eyes in the pool. And that's also why when you come out of a pool and you've been in a pool for quite some time and it feels a little bit slimy on your skin because you've had the chlorine, as the hydrochloric acid, eating away at a very, very weak concentration, but it's still been eating away at your skin. And you know, that's what's going on. And it it is a bit interesting from that concept to sit down and think, but from a human body perspective, there is only one place where hydrochloric acid belongs, and that's your stomach. Your stomach is designed to utilize hydrochloric acid. The stomach acid is hydrochloric acid. So our bodies do have hydrochloric acid in them, but we don't need it in our lungs. We don't need it in our eyes, and we certainly don't need it in our skin. But that is also why things like the mustard gas and chlorine gas are actually quite deadly. Okay. High concentrations, you're suddenly breathing acid. <laughs> yeah, I think I'll go swim in the lake from now on. <laughs> <laughs> don't like my skin getting eaten away by the acid. Hmm. <laughs> I have to admit, I don't. I have to admit, I don't like going to the normal pools anyway, because I just feel so drained afterwards. But that's just me. <laughs> okay, so so there was mustard gas, and then you 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 mentioned chlorine gas. What were some of the other things that you you could potentially I be exposed to? I think you to? said ricin and sarin and BX, if I'm not mistaken, there, Dave. Yes, uh, sarin and VX, I know, are nerve agents. The reason why they're called nerve agents is because those particular chemicals will interfere with the nerve signals to our brain. And they, it has a, what it'll do is the nerve cells that control our muscular movements will all of a sudden be stuck in the on position, or they might be stuck in the off position. And it will cause spasms to occur in our different muscle groups. So you might have arms or legs flopping around. Or what more commonly happens is it affects your the muscles controlling your breathing. And you wind up not being able to breathe. So you wind up uh, suffocating yourself and dying that way. Ew, yuck. Yeah, it's not... No, 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 no thanks. <laughs> Yeah, no, not a fun way to go. Now, VX is VX and Sarin are very closely related. VX is the more deadly of the two. For those who have never heard of VX, um, dare I say it? Here I go, pop culture again. The movie um, The Rock with Sean Connery and Nicolas Cage. Oh yeah, that. The, that was actually the, the chemical weapon that they were trying to disarm was VX bombs. And those, I think at one point in the video, in that movie, there was a, a scene where they show what happened to the human body Ex if it's exposed to VX. And it was pretty brutal. Yeah. Except they showed blisters. And I don't think VX blisters from what I've read, Doc. I did do a little bit of side reading because, well, I cover this kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's true. That is true. But at the end of the day, I mean, when you're talking about any of these weapons, it's just the small amount. Yeah, we just, we don't want to go there. I, we really, I, really don't want to go there. Looking back on the movie The Rock, I will say Hollywood took a few liberties with the chemical <laughs> weapons. Because the amount of exposure that Nicolas Cage got exposed to, that one ball He should of have it, died! <laughs> instant, almost instantly. There was not he a chance he was going to come back from it. Uh, what he stuck himself with now is something that they do uh, distribute to 
uh, the military in places where they believe that we might chance getting exposed to it through warfare or whatever. And that is um, essentially their their atropine pens. What's in there is a three chemical combination. The first one is an antidote. The second one is going to that you'll inject yourself with will speed up your heart. It's a stimulant, so it's going to uh, try adrenaline. adrenaline usually, and it'll try and push the antidote through your system as quickly as possible. Also, hopefully, flush out some of uh, the chemical in the process. And the third one, it will counteract the adrenaline. This way it brings your heart rate back down to normal, so your heart doesn't explode. That's a good thing. We don't want hearts exploding everywhere. It's no. not Valentine's Day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, you know, talk about uh, your lovely arrow, you know, chemical weapon arrows from uh, Kim Jong-un. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, no, we don't want to do that. No, sorry. We really, really don't want to go there. Okay. Dare I ask it? And what no. chemicals? You Obviously, when you're doing your training, you have to be exposed to something. Yes. What are they exposing you to? Okay. There's four types of blood or four types of chemical agents they teach us about. It's blood, blister choking and nerve the fifth one is not a chemical weapon per se it's what's called an irritant and okay um what they use when we go into the gas chamber yes it's called a gas chamber we'll go in with our protective gear on and then while in there we'll we'll crack the seal on our mask and expose ourselves to this uh irritant which is, um, to it is capsaicin. We call it CS gas. It is on the Scovian scale that you use to rate the hotness of peppers. It comes in at about two hundred million Scovians. And, oh, yes. <laughs> I see. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean it's not something you want to be exposed to for long periods of time, just because it's all, you can still breathe. But it's really hard to breathe. And it attacks the mucous membranes in your body and on your skin, so your sweat glands. When you leave the gas chamber, you are a mess. You will have snot and mucus coming off of out of your nose and you'll want to spit. And everywhere that you are sweating will now have this burning sensation on it. Thankfully, with CS gas, the easy way to decontaminate yourself is to expose yourself to air. And okay. so what you will see happen is everybody will come out of the gas chamber, pull their mask off, it, start walking with their arms extended, and they'll start flapping their arms around, fully extended. <laughs> Or doing circles I just with had this arms. Vision. I just had this vision of a whole bunch of you just walking around like you're trying to fly. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and That's quite a funny sight. Oh, yeah. And then uh, usually in basic training, there's another little funny thing that goes along with this. When we leave the gas chamber, right outside the gas chamber, that little pathway will usually be called chili macro. It's chili macro. Some places, sometimes it might be, you know, coleslaw row. It is whatever you had, whatever your last meal was. That's potentially what might be on that walk. Oh, yeah. Oh, Dave. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, guys. I got a little, you know, a yeah, little graphic no, there. Okay, okay. No, no. Right. No. Ew. Yuck. No. <laughs> Carrots. No. no. Don't they give you a shot for another chemical weapon? The only... A shot? What do you mean a shot? I was thinking anth your anthrax shots. Ah, uh, yes. Now, that's taking us over into the biological warfare. The, the Everything that we've talked about, the blood, the blister agents, the mustard gas, the sarin, that's all chemical weapons. Uh, anthrax, uh, Judy might know more about it. 
But anthrax is a biological agent. Yeah, uh, anthrax is actually a bacteria, um, and it's it's basically one of those really really bad t- bacterials that can just attack the body really quickly. But because it is a bacteria, you can fight it with antibiotics, which is actually really quite good. Yeah. Okay, so that's but why they can give them a shot. Really for strong it. fight. Yeah. What was that? That's why they can give them a shot for it in advance. The sh- exactly. Well, the shot they give us is an antibiotics. It's a vaccine. There is an anthrax vaccine that most of the regular populace doesn't get. On occasion, there's been known side effects that have not been uh, really wonderful. But it is safe to use. And so when we deploy it to different areas outside of the... Uh, U.S. will have to go and get our shots updated. Well, we have to get our shot, our vaccinations updated on a regular basis as a way to combat biological warfare and just to keep us healthy. You don't need, you know, everybody on a Navy ship all coming down with the flu. Or the measles. <laughs> or the measles, the mumps, or, you know, they get exposed to anthrax. Now, the other easy way to defend yourself against biological agents is cleanliness, is good field sanitation, or what we call, you know, when we go out to the field, staying clean. You yeah, do that? no, you definitely have to, I mean, even from a camping point of view, when I took the scouts, because I was a scout leader for some time, you, you had to have very strict cleanliness in your kitchen area in particular. When you're on jamborees, the number of times I had to sanitize my hands, oh, my hands got so dry. <laughs> Because you were always sanitizing your hands. You were always sanitizing the surfaces that you're cleaning on. Everything just gets wiped down. Because if it, I mean, the best preventative of anything that's going to be bacterial is just to clean. Mm-hmm. That's yeah. it. End of story. Just clean. And, and it's the same in your home. You know, just clean. It's the easiest uh, Okay, so soap and water prevent. can help beat a bacteria? Is that what you guys are both getting at? Soap, water, soap and, and water can get kill it, yes, depending on the soap you use. Maybe just use a good antibacterial soap. Uh, and also, when you're camping, sometimes they get a bad rep, but the hand sanitizers that they distribute, you know, that they sell little bottles of, those come in handy when you can't you know, always stay as clean as you want to be. Oh, I have I have so many of those in my bag. I I carry one of those in my in my purse, so that way, even when I'm at a, a mall and I'm just deciding to have food in the food court at the mall, I can just quickly sanitize my hands, and I know that my burger that my hands are now wrapping around, I'm all good. Mm-hmm. So those little things they may sound like they're really silly, but it is the best way to prevent bacterial type based stuff and so i mean anthrax falls into that category but i think what made anthrax one of the ones and what made it hit the news because i i do remember this several years ago is where you had powder anthrax powder that was going through the mail and people were opening up their mail and breathing it in you you get bacteria in your lungs (laughs) you get sick you get sick, really, really sick, because, yeah, you, you start affecting your <laughs> pathways and you can't breathe, and it's not good stuff. Definitely not good. No, not good at all. Besides anthrax and some of these other things, okay, I'm going to be the pessimist a little bit here, and <laughs> let's talk a little bit about the radiological. Do you take any steps to prepare yourself against that stuff? No, for the radiation, there's not a lot you can do. I know on occasions such as like when uh, that one nuclear plant in Japan uh, had the meltdown here a few years ago because of the tsunami, I heard rumors that they were distributing iodine tabs to our military personnel overseas that were near that area. Uh, iodine apparently absorbs some of the radiation that your body can yes, pick up. But otherwise, yes, yes. what they teach us is, one, stay away from our radars. Uh, radars emit radiation, and we have safe zones around our radars. 
And then uh, the other thing that I can think of is there is some defense against a nuclear explosion. They say, you know, put your uh, thumbs in your ears and exhale. So this way you're uh, for something to do with the explosion. But really, if you're anywhere near nuclear blast, well, hopefully you survive it. Uh, otherwise, yeah, you're going to get okay. hit with the radiation. Of, uh, okay, coming back to the science side, you were saying, you know, nuclear blast, you put your thumbs in your ears and sort of exhale the time. That's because of the pressure. When you were talking about a nuclear blast, okay, so you're talking about that mushroom cloud, you actually don't see that mushroom cloud that you might see fantastically within all the movies and, and the tests that they have done. You don't see that until after the initial explosion. The initial explosion is actually your concussion wave. And the concussion wave, it's just a, a wall of pressure that comes through and just knocks everything over. And if you get hit with a really solid pressure wave, it can do a lot to your body because, I mean, it's like, think of what would happen the if Moab you are... The Moab bomb that they just dropped was a pressure bomb designed to just collapse tunnels. Would that be... Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. But I'm thinking, okay, think about if all those crash test dummies that you got, you know, they, they put them in the car things and they deliberately drive them to a wall and just to watch how much they crumple and to see what sort of effects that that impact is going to have on the body. Yeah. Well, that's exactly what would happen with a pressure wave. You, you're basically driving a car into this solid brick wall. Ouch, The doc. further you are, yeah, the further you are away from the point of impact, the less the pressure wave is, the, the weaker that pressure wave is. So it does dissipate with distance. And with a certain distance, it basically just feels like a strong gust of wind has brushed over you. Yeah, um... The radiation fallout is the mushroom cloud. So you, your first bet is that pressure wave that comes around, and then it goes up into the air, and it creates that mushroom cloud. And as that dissipates, that's when the radiation comes. So that's actually part – That's it's a secondary effect. It's not your primary effect. So... And the radiation fallout is completely different. It's all – a th- it's a related to the wind flows going through the atmosphere. So there's a whole bunch of factors as to how much radiation you will be exposed to in those situations. Ironically, human beings are surrounded by radiation, absolutely surrounded by it. If we are looking at, say, our computer screens, we are being exposed to radiation. Then, Doc, I must be exposed to radiation all day, every day. I'm always staring at some kind of screen. (laughs) And me, too. Uh, Uh, If you are wearing a digital wristwatch, you are being exposed to radiation. It's radiating me. So why why is everybody not having just females? Well, that's a a joke that goes around some of the army units that have... Okay, well, we don't need to go there. (laughs) Down, (laughs) Dave. This is the military humor show. I, I know it's not okay. the military humor, we, so... We, we just don't need to go there. Right. So, basically, what radiation does to the body is it... If you think back to when we were talking to Dan Cobalt in genetics, he was talking about how cancers were basically your DNA getting corrupted. Right. If mm-hmm. you, yeah. And, and that's basically what radiation does, is it actually attacks portions of your cells, and it goes... Yeah, no, we're not going to be normal anymore. We're going to just tweak you just a little bit and turn you into something else. The thing is, is those mutations that occur within the cells are rapid. Okay. They're not So it turns small, good cells bad real quick. They turn the cells bad real quick. And that's where radiation poisoning comes in. So it, it, it's a lot of cells within your body turning bad all at once and everything going ick. Those who worked in the first lot of x-rays, when they were first developing the x-ray machines, 
they were being exposed to a large amount of radiations and they actually suffered from radiation poisoning. And you don't necessarily know what the radiation poisoning differences are because it's very similar to cancer. The it was a female engineer, a female scientist, I believe, that actually developed some of the first x-rays. I seem to remember hearing that she had actually passed away because of uh, cancer was the cause of her that death. Was, exactly, and that was the thing. Most people just assumed that the radiation poisoning was actually just cancer, not realizing that actually it was a different it was actually something else. But that's the thing. The symptoms of radiation poisoning are an accelerated form of cancer. Hey, guys, hold those thoughts. We got to take a commercial break. We'll see you on the other side. You are listening to KLRN Radio, where liberty and reason still reign. Most writers and radio show hosts know that to connect with your fans, you need to do more than just write books or record the latest podcasts. There are many different elements that go into forming an online platform, but there are also many hidden traps. To make matters worse, solid advice on how to survive the muddy waters is scarce. In the book Hidden Traps, I talk about some of the important issues of working with an online platform, highlighting traps that could put your physical or internet security at risk, or be harmful to your reputation. Are your social media posts just links with a few disjointed words making you look like someone who can't complete a sentence? Did your new website cost you more than you anticipated? Are you leaking your personal contact details across the web without even knowing it? Then you need Hidden Traps. Although Hidden Traps is not officially released until August 1st, you can pre-order your paperback or ebook copy now from a variety of retailers, including Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and Kobo. Visit BlackWolfPublications.com for more details. Here's George Foreman with InventHelp. Hi, I'm George Foreman. Do you have an idea for a new product or invention? People ask me all the time, George, how do I get my idea in front of companies? How do I get a patent? What do I do next? Do you have the same questions? I'll tell you like I'll tell them all. Call my friends at InventHelp. Call InventHelp today for free information. InventHelp has been helping inventors for more than 30 years and has sales offices nationwide. InventHelp can submit your invention to companies who are interested in receiving new ideas. If you have an idea and want to try to patent it and submit it to companies, you should call InventHelp today for free information. Listen, I can't guarantee a company will be interested in your idea, but I believe every inventor deserves the opportunity to step into the ring and take their best shot. Put InventHelp in your corner. Get your free inventor's information. Call 1-800-353-6490. That's 1-800-353-6490. Again, 1-800-353-6490. KLRN Radio has advertising rates available. We have rates to fit almost any budget. Contact us at advertising at klrnradio.com. This is Slickery Trigger for Rebel Road Tactical. With proper care and feeding, your pistol will be ready when you need it. There to save your life. Shouldn't your gear be that good? Whether you need a holster for comfortable, everyday carry, or a tough-as-nails holster for your next training course, Rebel Road Tactical has what you need. Check us out on the web at rebelroadtactical.com. If you're 85 or younger, would you like peace of mind and comfort for your family? We're Final Expense Direct with an urgent message for you. The average funeral today costs over $8,000, but the most you'll get from government benefits is $255. How will your family pay the difference? We can help. Our senior plans start as low as just a dollar a day and pay up to $30,000 for a funeral and other final expenses. 
Peace of mind is easy. There's no medical exam. You'll have lifetime coverage, and your plan can't be canceled as long as you pay your premiums. Call now for free information about our senior plans. Answer a few simple questions and receive approval right on the phone. Plus, call right now and we'll give you a discount prescription card for free. Call 800-553-8687. That's 800-553-8687. Again, 800-553-8687. All right. Thank you for hanging in there with us here at Conversations in Science while we paid those radio bills. Now back to the show. Okay. Now, what about the movies where we see people with blisters after... A uh, nuclear blast or being exposed to n- nuclear radiation, does that still happen? Yeah, well, again, those are the heat um, sort of aspects. You get you get some heat coming through, instant sort of radiations of the heat, and it will blister your skin. It's burning you is what it's doing. But there are other forms of cancer as well that cause blisters too. So, and this is what I'm saying, the radiation poisoning is actually, it, it shows up as cancer, is okay. how it, it manifests itself. Most of the time, our human body, if we're exposed to small concentrations of radiation, the human body can compensate. We know how to actually deal with it. The so it's sun okay to get is emitting my, radiation. So it's okay to get my leg x-ray, Doc? Yes. Yes, it is okay to get your leg x-ray. And in fact... If you take a look, I mean, they go through and they put a lead apron on you on a regular basis to help protect your central body. Um, That is basically, they just don't want you to have too much exposure to radiation. And they will keep a monitor on radiologists and the uh, operators for the x-ray machines. There is a very strict regulations depending on where you are in the world as to how much you can be exposed to if you are a worker in the field. And ironically, the levels that employees of the field can be exposed to is less than what the general population can be exposed to. It's quite ironic when you think about it. But that also tells you how safe it is to use some of these instruments because a radiologist would not be in doing the constant bits of x-rays and all of those other bits and pieces if they weren't safe with these levels of the amount of radiation they're allowed to be exposed to being less than the general population. And I think, but correct me if I'm wrong, guys, I think I found your female scientist. Yes, Google Foo at work here, Doc. Was it Marie Curie? Curie? Uh, Marie Curie, she was, do, she did familiar. a lot of work with and um, radiation and, and other bits and pieces, but she, I don't think she was the one who did the X-ray. There is a, it's a classic image. The very, very first X-ray was of a woman's hand and there's a ring in the hand. It was actually the wife of the man who developed the first X-ray machine. And I can't, I cannot remember. I just remember seeing the images. I think Mary. It's a classic image. The Hang on. Curie, I think, was the one who <laughs> may have first discovered that X rays will affect a photographic plate, and somebody else came along and put some engineering behind it. I do yeah, remember I there being. So. There was like multiple <laughs> people involved. It's been since high school since I heard about Curie or the how X rays came about. Uh, just for everybody's reference. High school was Rod uh, Wilhelm Ron Jen Ron Jen discovered Yeah, the exist- that sounds about right. Some German name <laughs> discovered the existence of X rays through the mech- though the mechanism behind their production was not yet understood, and that was in eighteen ninety five. Yep, we've had X rays for a very very long time, and you'll see photographs if you do a, a historical Google search. You'll see photographs of people. You know, they have some sort of x-ray generator, and then you have somebody standing, and then you have the person standing there holding the plate in front of them. So you've got not only the patient being exposed to the x-rays, but the person holding the plate is also being <laughs> exposed to x-rays. It's oh, like, what I saw on, uh, on a TV show here in America one time, They uh, the show does restoration of these old machine types stuff, usually Coca-Cola machines or coolers, or whatnot, 
but they got this one machine where you would put it up at a storefront, stick your feet underneath, and it would x-ray your feet. So this way you could go and buy the correct shoe and have the most perfect fit shoe. They got a hold of the machine and they realized, wait a minute, it will still perform its function and make x-rays. And so they had to bring in a specialist and they pulled out the elements that actually made the x-rays. Because they were like, oh yeah, this is radiating the whole room once they <laughs> tested it. <laughs> now they got yeah, the machine uh, looking nice and they... The radiation bits and pieces <laughs> uh, on all that sort of side. I mean, you can protect yourself and there's different levels of the radiation um, from dealing with x-rays and bits and pieces. And this, the ironic thing is that I don't know about what it's like in the States, but in New Zealand, every single home in New Zealand has actually got a alpha radiation source in the, the in their homes. Now, alpha radiation, it's one of the strong forms of radiation. You've got three different forms that are out there. You've got alpha, beta, and gamma. Now, we have I think I spoke about this at one point, and I can't remember what episode we were talking about that. But with alpha radiation, you can actually, it's such a weak form, you can stop it with a piece of paper. It's yes. a very weak form. But I think this was also America, the climate change because we were talking about the sun and stuff like that. And I seem to I remember think from. We might have been, but the americium um, is the chemical that's in our fire alarms it's a radioactive source and it's quite funny because i think in the states you use something else i think your fire alarms are a completely different structure and no, we have i think to... getting hold of things like radioactive sources is a lot harder it's been... than it is here <laughs> oh it's been severely regulated uh, there's, of course, you know, we haven't had a nuclear test in ages, but they used to test them out, uh, not too far away from Las Vegas, Nevada. And they used to take tours out there and have people watch from a safe, a safe <laughs> distance. I say that with quotes around it, watch the nuclear explosions oh, and yes, from these nuclear tests. Like a good idea. I, I'm not sure that is the most safe thing. Um, uh, <laughs> I am familiar with what you're talking about with the alpha waves, which is like a hydrogen or a helium nucleus. Yes. Yeah, it's a hydrogen nucleus. Beta, yeah. I believe, is electrons. It is. And uh, also, I happen to work around a part of the Army that we use a radar system on a regular basis, and I know our radar produces beta waves. That's what. So a lot of electrons are going flying around. Oh, yes. <laughs> And then you have the gamma radiation, which, oh boy, that's the stuff that will really cook you if you get exposed so to So how it. many electrons does it take to make a light bulb? Do you want the <laughs> number in watts, volts, or electron volts? <laughs> I'm not really sure. And are we talking LEDs or... Okay, we... <laughs> okay, okay, okay. We are totally, You're totally getting off here. topic here. Sorry. <laughs> so. Sorry. Okay, so we have we have spoken about how... The military actually prepares its soldiers to deal with biological, chemical, and to a lesser extent, radiological weaponry. We have spoken about what some of these weapons are. Now, here's the one thing that I, I thought was interesting when I was doing some prep for this show. We, the gas that you use to test, um, to train the soldiers in how to use the equipment is actually available in the public sector for the police to deal with crowd control. But I seem to remember things like tear gas is not legal to use in warfare. Can mm. go into the, can you give us a little bit of insight onto this one? Because this is just it seems to me just odd. It seems odd to me it also, um, like I said, we've got those four types of chemical agents. You have the blood blister, choking, and nerve. And those are outlawed by the Geneva Conventions. The Geneva Conventions are named for the town in Switzerland, Geneva, where they were signed or created. And they govern 
everybody who has signed on to the Geneva Conventions has essentially said, this is the law of warfare. Here's the things that we will, here's how we will conduct war. Uh, one of the Geneva Conventions covers uniforms and ID cards and what you do with captured prisoners. It also governs the use, or rather, governs the non-use of chemical weapons in warfare. Now, the irritants, like CS gas, is not classified as chemical weapons, but we're still not allowed to use it in warfare. So we can't just go and use it to put down say, a whole bunch of ISIS fighters that are attacking. We can't just flood the area with capsaicin pellets. Can't do it. It's not lethal, so I don't know why we can't do it, but it's not allowed. However, your local police force in many countries, they have access to tear gas, which tear gas and CS gas are closely related. They're both irritants, both real easy to, you know, decontaminate yourself or have others decontaminate you without, you know, long-term effects. And the police get to use them for crowd control and riot control. But we're just not allowed to use them, you know, in the army or navy. It's just not allowed. It just sounds really odd. Maybe I'm just, I don't know, maybe it's just my... my brighter brain that's come in there. Well, for anyone know. who's <laughs> curious, there are, everybody in the world has not signed the Geneva Convention. Yeah. I remember uh, during World War II, it was a bit of an issue because America had signed some of the original Geneva Conventions, but Japan at the time had not. So you'd hear stories of Japanese soldiers torturing captured American soldiers, POWs. But we were not allowed to do the same thing. <laughs> you can Google it. Yeah, you can Google the Geneva Conventions and what they do and don't allow. Yeah, um, yeah. Oh. there's a lot of information out on the internet about that sort of thing. I will say okay. one thing. No known terrorist group has signed the Geneva Convention. Can I leave it at that, Doc? <laughs> yeah, you can leave it at that. That, you can leave it at that. Definitely, that's fine. Yeah. Okay. And I'm not sure so our Sierra soldiers also. are being, the soldiers around the world are being trained to have to deal with some of this. And, and some of the public, in some respects, are as well. It is interesting to hear some of these experiences. I have to admit, I, I think I'll stick with medieval weaponry. <laughs> Because <laughs> at least that was more, I don't know, more fun. <laughs> yeah, it depends um, on which end you're, whether you're on the giving end or the receiving end. No matter how you look at it, warfare is not, it's not fun when you're in, in the middle of it. Well, that, yeah, no, it's definitely not fun when you're in the middle of it. But from a me from my mechanical brain and my engineering background, the medieval weaponry is just a lot more interesting and so I think I'll just stick with that. <laughs> one of the things I... I picked up as a military spouse is no one prays for peace more than the soldier fighting the war. That is very true. That is very, very true. Okay. Is there any questions that you can think of, Jess, that you had that we haven't covered? I just wanted the public to realize that chemical weapons are something that's out there but you're not going to likely run into it at your local grocery store. No, it's, you're not. Unless you happen to live in an area that's in a state of war. You're probably fine. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, far, probably are. The, right now, the, there's only a few places around the world where chemical weapons have been recorded as having been used and might still be used. Uh, Syria is the big one that comes up. Well, we don't get yeah. into politics and current events on this one, Dave, but thanks for reminding everybody. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So, I mean, basically, as, as from a public perspective, as long as you're aware of what's there, then you can take steps to protect yourself easily enough. Um, and I wouldn't worry too, too much because 
most of the Western world, anyway, is not actually in war. So we're, we're reasonably okay, reasonably safe. Um, is there any other questions or anything else that you can think of, Jess? Yeah, I do have one thing for Dave. Okay. What's How it? hot does that mop gear get? Or is that comfortable stuff to wear? No, it's not comfortable. And you will sweat in mop gear. It, hold on, I will put a qualification on that. In the summertime, mop gear is not comfortable at all. In the wintertime, it can be nice and warm. Uh, it, because it will be training in the middle of winter and have to have the mop gear on. And it just keeps us warm. But at the end of the day... You think, okay, well, I'm doing fine. I didn't sweat that much. But then you you pull off your rubber boots and you have water that comes out of your rubber boots because you sweated that much. Ew. <laughs> One other yeah. question. How do you drink when you're in mop gear or do you? There is a way. Um, every, pro, every protective mask has a drinking tube on it. It's just a rubber tube and it will fit inside uh, the caps to, to our canteens. Makes it kind of crazy because we'll take a little one-quart canteen and put the straw in there and have to hold it upside down by our face to get the water out. That's the- another <laughs> funny picture. Oh. That's another funny one. Yeah. There is uh, some of those camelbacks that they issue to us. There is attachments so that we can pull the water out of there through our drink tubes. However, they have to have the right type of uh, bladder to be resistant to chemical weapons for us to be able to use them. And those, for whatever reason, I think economics, they just are not widely distributed. The army... I can see that, Dave. I can see that one because, well, the Army does only have so many dollars to go around, and there's a lot of you soldiers. Yeah. Let's face it. Oh, yes. There is. Okay. I think we have potentially come to an end of the show. If anybody has any questions about this topic, please feel free to contact us at the radio station. And that's at science at KLRN Radio. We'll pass on your questions and comments to Dave, and we will get some answers for you. Right. Well, that brings us to an end of another Conversations in Science. If you have any questions about science and about some of the world around us, feel free to drop me a line. I'm on Twitter. And you can find me at Judy L. Moore, or you can look me up on Facebook, Judy L. Moore, or you can drop me a line on my personal website, JudyLmore.com. I think you're seeing the pattern here. Then, of course, if you are interested in some of the other projects I do, which is the writing and editing, feel free to check me out on BlackWolfEditorial.com. But then, of course, don't forget, if you are wanting more information about the science, you can also contact us at the station with the email of science at klrnradio.com. Then, of course, there's my cohort that keeps going through and popping up. You mean me, Doc? Well, for anybody who wants to track me down, you can find me on Twitter at Jesse's POV. And you can also drop me a line at the station at Jesse's POV at klrnradio.com. Bye, guys. Bye.